How's it going everybody? So today's video encompasses probably the greatest car that I've owned in my collection. And what I mean by greatest is not, it's not the fastest, it's not the sportiest, but when I look back at something that I found the most trustworthy and reliable out of any car I've ever owned in the 15 years of owning cars, it's this car. I, uh, I had to do wait a decent amount of time before I really gave this the credit of being the most reliable car. And that's for several reasons, because a lot of people will just do a review on a car that they've had for a day or a week. Heck, they've even had it for just an hour. I've had this car nearly two and a half years. In fact, it's the longest out of all the diesels that I've owned from time frame wise. I had my CD for about a, a year or so, the 240, um, just a little bit longer than that. This I've had two and a half years going on three. And uh, truly, driving it as a daily for the last two and a half years, through the worst conditions, the hottest conditions, the coldest conditions, I safely have given this credit due to this car as being the most reliable car. Now, we need to separate reliability and being the world's most reliable car and maintenance free because those are two two different things that we need to separate and put into factor when it comes to this. This is not a maintenance free car, but it's a car that I have felt will get you to the destination regardless of what's going wrong with the vehicle. So let's just get a quick walk around on this car. So you kind of, if you're new to the diesel market or any of thing else, let's start with the year. So 1985, this was the last year of the W123 wagon. And in my opinion, it's probably the best out of all the years of the W123 wagons. And that's for several reasons. It had the most features at the being the last given year. It also has some aftermarket, I wouldn't say aftermarket, factory aftermarket upgrades that the regular 123 and OM617 diesel engines did not have. The rear end is one of those uh, variants. Uh, it has a ratio that's different from the other wagons and it gives it better highway cruising speed and RPM based. The transmission itself amazingly has a torque converter and the rev variant on the torque converter is almost 20, 2500 RPM, I think. And so I kid you not, you can like almost launch it. It sounds hilarious. But if you were to drive like an 83 wagon, there is no, you cannot do uh, a high rev torque as far as a launch. And what I mean by that is you hold the brake and get on the rev, the throttle, and you can actually watch the RPMs go. You'll hear the boost in the turbo build, and then you can let go of the brake and it really puts you back in the seat. So the acceleration of this being an 85 is far greater than what you get out of an 83. And so that's what really separates this vehicle from the other wagons. Now you'll see on some wagons, they have the circular headlights on both sides. That looks like four eyes. This has the Euro headlights. And I'm coming to find out that, that that's a rare option or they're getting harder to find. You can actually get Euro headlights and put them on an American spec uh, car. And I've done the aftermarket uh, Hella 500 fog lights and of course the signature Turbo D Euro plate. Now this car is a blue on blue interior and yes that is a side exhaust. You're probably wondering what the heck that is. Well we have to look back in the channel because there's a video of me doing a video specifically on the side exhaust and I did that for multitude of reasons. This car, when I got it from the factory, yes, people are gonna start crying, was too quiet. I didn't like how quiet it was. You couldn't even hear the motor rev, you just hear the vibrations. I didn't like that. I felt that an inline five turbo is a very distinctive sound that emits usually an exhaust note that is beautiful. And that side exhaust, I had to do that mod. So I got rid of the super restrictive exhaust on this and did a side exit. And frankly, I love it and I've had it I mean, I put that exhaust on within the first month of owning this vehicle. It sounds really good. And I'll give you a little sound bite when starting it up. So I'll open up the driver's door here uh, so you can get a quick view of the interior. Let me pull the key out because, you know, it's going to just... So this gives you some perspective on the interior. This is 1985. These are the most comfortable seats known to man. It's probably what separates the W123 from everybody else in the 80s. What I mean by everybody else is every other car manufacturer is these Dane seats are like a lazy boy couch on the road. 
It's incredible. So, two front seats. Here's the rear. We unlock the car here. I have a blanket here to protect it because my dog's always riding with me, but the interior on this car is actually in really, really good shape. Um, this, the seats are immaculate. So I've wanted to, I'm trying to protect them because this car has survived this long. Uh, and back seats, they fold down, super useful. Um, so that gives you a little perspective on the inside. Factory roof rails. I used to, if you saw in some of the older videos, had a huge roof rack. And I actually loved the roof rack, but I kid you not, I could not open the sunroof. Uh, well, I mean, I could open up the sunroof. The wind noise was horrific. It was so loud. And I was like, you know what? I miss being able to open up the sunroof, cruise down the highway because, I mean, the sunroof is like the greatest thing ever. So I took it off and I think I actually got eight more miles to the gallon. It, it really did hurt the, <laughs> the gas mileage. So we'll give it a little walk around, give you a perspective on the wagon. They have a tow hitch. I use that all the time. Another perspective on interior. Blue on blue. I didn't think I'd own a blue on blue vehicle, but this color has grown on me. So, two and a half years of owning this car. And what I say is why I love this car so much. There's something about driving a 123, and I'll never be able to explain it. You just have to go drive one. And don't drive a crappy one. You gotta go, go drive a good one, and you'll really appreciate the dynamic of the car. And when I say the dynamic is how they drive, they talk to you, how they feel on the road, it speaks volumes about a time and an era that Mercedes really put all their heart and soul into building a quality car. And that, I feel, is what makes this one of the last great models to come out of the factory. There's some great cars in the late 80s to early 90s, I think. Heck, even 2000s emitted some good cars. But something that was just up, <coughs> off the production line, into the hands of everyday people, and you think about this, this car is nearly 40 years old, and it's still driving on the road today. You're not gonna see that with a lot of vehicles of modern technology, you're just not. If, if you're gonna find a Hyundai that's 40 years from now, I wanna know how many computers and electrical harnesses have been replaced on it, and how many turbos, and if it's a hybrid, how many battery packs. This car has yet to have the cylinder head off on it, and it has, I just rolled over 356,000 miles. 356,000 miles, and it is the same gaskets, engine, turbo, transmission, everything. There's nothing that has been replaced on this car as far as big stuff. Now, when we go back to the factor of being the world's most reliable car and being not a maintenance-free car, they're, they're, that is true. I have had to fix things on this car. In fact, I had the alternator fail on me about four months ago, just completely seized up, was the original one. And hilariously enough, the engine had so much torque that it just smoked the belt and I knew something was wrong. So, new alternator. I've had a couple of electrical switch gremlins go on. I've had uh, glow plugs, you know, basic stuff. But when it comes to serious failures, I've never had a serious failure ever in any of the diesels that I've owned. And, you know, if you ask me, well, would you take this 356,000 mile vehicle and drive it to California tomorrow, halfway across the United States? I wouldn't even think twice. And, and why I say that is because these cars are built, they're overly engineered. They, on everything, the suspension, the engine, the build quality, everything about this car is just over-engineered. It was built by the engineers to say, hey, we want this to see this on the road for the next half century. And they couldn't have been more uh, serious about that statement because it, I would drive this. I would not drive an 85 Nissan with 356,000 miles across America. I, would, I, I mean, I'd try it, but I would be slightly concerned that it would not get me home. This car has yet to not get me home. And I've had multitude of things break on it. Throttle actuator, in fact, just broke two weeks ago. I fixed it by going to Home Depot and getting two nuts in a brace and completely fixed that. If you're on the market for a wagon, 
this is where I'd say the biggest con you need to look for when buying a wagon. Rust is a killer on these cars. That's one thing that was not fully understood back in the day on how to minimize, and that's rust. Unfortunately, this car does have some rust. Right here, I have a bubble right here, and of course, on my back fender, I'm starting to get some cancer right here. I would say that was a concern of mine that I should have thought more uh, involved, I guess is the best way to say, when driving this in the winter. I drove this in the winter year round for two, two winters, and I'm not gonna drive it this coming winter. In fact, I'm gonna put it away because I feel that the that's what contributed to a lot of the rust on this vehicle. So that's a big thing you gotta look out for if you're on the market for one, is rust. Rust is, is I would say, the biggest killer of these cars, unfortunately. That's what has brought a lot of these cars to the grave is they just the rust, they rust through. Another factor is people that, yes, they are very reliable, but they do require maintenance. Oil changes are huge on these, and I am religious on the dot at 3,000 miles, and I do not go beyond that. Diesels inherently burn dirtier, and they run at a lot higher temps, so oil fails. There's people that have ran these cars 8,000 miles without doing an oil change, and I find that that is detrimental to the longevity of these engines. I'm gonna pop the hood and show you this engine. I would say that that's one of the biggest, most factors to consider if you are looking at one of these make sure it has oil change records make sure that the blow by isn't bad you can run the piss out of these i don't drive this nice and granny like I'm, I'm in the throttle all the time with this i drive it hard i also change the oil religiously and i feel that that is what's contributed to this lasting so long and being headache free and the motor still running strong as ever so change the oil often on these uh let me pop the hood and i'll show you the signature diesel OM617 sound. Another factor to consider is if you are at altitude. I'm at 6,000, 7,000 feet. Start up, we look for glow plug light. It'll shut off. Oil pressure light comes on, or not light, oil pressure gauge. All my gauges work, 356,000 miles. This is one of the rare models that I found that instead of a clock, a big old clock, it has an actual tack, which is kind of cool. I don't that's the best sound in the world now you might understand why I did the exhaust mod on that <laughs> so if you're on the market for a wagon or an in general a W123 consider these things let me just pop the hood consider these things okay and you might not be able to hear me talk because of the glorified sound of the inline 5 Mercedes turbo diesel engine So you can actually hear me talk instead of trying to yell if you're looking at one of these all right there's things that you want to look at and you want to consider i'm at high altitude i've had a 240 diesel if you've seen that video check it out if not look in my videos there's a i owned a manual 240d made an astonishing 70 horsepower i think there's a multitude of numbers but let's say 70 horsepower it was the slowest car i've ever owned i also enjoyed driving that car because it was just a, once again a very reliable car if you are looking at one of these, it's amazing the power difference of a turbo 617, which is a five cylinder turbo diesel versus a 240 four cylinder non-turbo. And there's also the variants of the 617 that has a non-turbo as well. That's also kind of gutless in my opinion. If you can obtain a turbo version of the, of the 123, it's worth it because the power difference is huge. If you can get an 85, it's even better because of the gearing and the torque converter. So consider those variables when looking at one of these. I, I would say that if you're at high altitude and you want to get on the traffic and accelerate quickly, a turbo is a must on one of these. Um, what I, another con that I've mentioned before is on the 240D, you have essentially a motor right here. It's easy to work on. You can get underneath, you can reach behind. On the, the OM617, the turbo is right underneath here. There's things that it's very compact. In fact, you know, it's got a brand new alternator. 
that was a pain in the butt to put on, to be honest. And, and it wasn't a pain of unbolting things. It was a pain to actually get the alternator up in there and to feed the bolts through. That was a pain for me. So it's a lot tighter than like if I was to do an alternator on a 240. So you gotta consider that, is that these are a little bit more cramped to work on. Another con to think about, parts are starting to get hard for these as far as finding them. That's not impossible. It's not like my 108 from 1968, but parts are starting to get difficult. Consider that variable that you can't go to O'Reilly's and get every part for this. I can still amazingly get glow plugs, oil filters, gaskets, and a couple other variants from O'Reilly's. And they're good name brand stuff, which is kind of funny from something 1985. But parts such as like interior pieces, I've been very anal about keeping the interior nice because most of the seats that you see on these 123s are just wrecked. Bolsters are cracked. And I mean, you look at the seats on this, they're pretty darn nice. There's no tears, there's no issues with them. So you gotta consider that uh, as a variable. Overall, this car, I don't think I'll ever get rid of this car. I've gone back and forth. I'm like, oh, okay, the you know the price point of these and what they're going for now, it's insane. 29,000 mile, 123 when I'm bringing a trailer for like 85,000 bucks or 84,000 bucks. I'm like, what the heck? So I've thought about it because this one is very clean. It's an incredibly well-driving example, but I can't, I don't know. I'm too attached to this car. It's one of those cars that you sit in it and you're like, you are a dang good car. And I've never guessed whether it was gonna get me to a place or not. And that's very rare, especially for a car from the 80s, but even in modern day vehicles. You know, you almost wanna have a good tow company on call. I've never even thought about that with this car, you know? But if there's one factor about this wagon that's probably my absolute favorite thing in the world and is what sold me on the wagon is this right here. Rear facing seats. I don't know how many cars you can buy today with rear facing seats with seat belts because <laughs> safety was not a factor. They just wanted to see how many little Timmy's we could get in the back. <laughs> right, Nugget? Yeah, little Timmy. Little Timmy. <laughs> So, rear facing seats is probably the best thing about this car, in my opinion. It's probably my favorite thing about this car. And, uh, well. Alright, so you're probably wondering what's the acceleration like on a 1985. 300 TD because everybody says if you read online that they're the slowest car in the world. Well, they're not the fastest cars in the world, but I don't think they're that slow. So let's see what the acceleration is like on one of these. <laughs> 